Have a seat and turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. We are working through our series through the book of Colossians, the image of the invisible God. Again, how Jesus already is, was, and how we are becoming the image of the invisible God. Colossians chapter 3 is where we find ourselves. And if you recall, last week we talked about the first part of Colossians is about finding fullness in our faith. That's Colossians chapter 1, 1 through Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. So chapters 1, 2, and a good portion of 3 are about finding fullness in our faith. You have been filled in Christ. And then we talked about last week, finding fullness in our family. That was chapters, chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. So fullness in our faith, fullness in our family. And we spoke frankly last week about marriage and parenting particularly the lie surrounding the fact that 50% of marriages end up in divorce. That's a lie. We saw that. Also about the lie how marriage is solely for my benefit and not that of the other. We addressed the abandonment and abdication of our responsibility toward God's principles for marriage and family being the reason that we are in the mess that we are in in our culture today. And on the way out last week, after that, a few of you said how much you appreciate my willingness to address the tough issues. That, last week, and sexual immorality a few weeks before that. And I want to let you know that this week is no different. (laughs) In fact, there is nothing more difficult in this text for Colossians and with the latent capacity for explosion, especially in our culture, in our day, than today's text. The very first word of our text describes why. And it's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, where it says, depending on your translation, slaves. Colossians 3.22, slaves or bondservants, we'll distinguish the two later, but slaves. When we think of slaves, that translates our thoughts into slavery. And slavery translates our thoughts into race. And race translates our thoughts into racism. And racism is a word that is spoken in our American lexicon nearly every day in our day, is it not? It's pervasive. How many of us have heard these ideas lately? I'm not judging the rightness or wrongness, benefit or detriment of them, but how many of us have heard systemic racism or reparations or George Floyd or critical race theory or Juneteenth? Yeah, it's hard not to hear those things in our day, is it not? President Biden recently addressed systemic racism as one of the great crises of our time, saying in a graduation address, quote, And now you face another inflection point. As we put this pandemic behind us, rebuild our economy, root out systemic racism, and tackle climate change, we're addressing the great crises of our time with a greater sense of purpose than before. In case you don't know what systemic racism is, systemic is of or relating to systems that affect the whole. That's systemic. Relating to systems that affect the whole. Racism is the idea, of course, according to the American Heritage Dictionary, the belief that race accounts for the differences in human character and ability in a particular race is superior. So systemic racism is the idea that our whole country, the systems of our republic, elevate one race over another. Just in case you wonder. And what about reparations? It's much talked about. The Associated Report or Associated Press reports that Evanston, Illinois is one of the first communities in America to emit reparations by giving black eligible residents $25,000 housing grants for down payments, repairs, or existing mortgages this year. So it's just happening now. And they achieve the money, the $10 million that's going out with legal marijuana taxes. Now some black residents say that this effort falls short and true atonement hasn't begun. 
Many question calling it reparations at all, but that's what Evanston, Illinois is beginning as one of the first communities. Of course, George Floyd was the black man who died on May 25th of 2020 that sparked a violent summer of outrage and protest across our country. And in case you didn't know, just on June 16th of 2021, a 700 pound bronze statue of George Floyd was unveiled outside the Newark, New Jersey City Hall. The mayor, Ross A. Baraka, apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, said, hopefully when people walk by and see it and they participate, hopefully it inspires them to become active in the struggles that are happening right here in Newark and right here in New Jersey. Of course, critical race theory is the idea which is working its way into the public education curriculum as a theory that the world is made up of oppressors and the oppressed. And treating that categorization as a result of the institutional systems designed and maintained to benefit those of a certain race while oppressing those of other races. At the same time acknowledging that there is no personal volition, permission, individually to erase or cross over those defined boundaries. And finally, Juneteenth, according to the HistoryChannel.com, is short for June 19th. And that marks the day when federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865 to take control of the state and ensure that all enslaved people were freed. The troops arrived a full, and maybe you didn't know this, the troops arrived a full two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so Juneteenth honors the end of slavery in the United States. And on June 17th of this year, about a week ago, it became a federal holiday. So there are so many different directions we could go on this, isn't there? I mean, you knew some of that. You've definitely heard the, the terms or the ideologies, if not the descriptions of them. And so it's really hard to miss in our culture. And so what do we say when we approach a text in the Bible that begins, slaves, slaves. Well, there is a bunch that we could say about it. But as you know, I've always tried to remain true to the text in which we find ourselves, and so we're going to let that be our guide today. So let's begin with this question in this latently, potentially explosive topic. Why would Paul include the conversation about slaves and masters in a discussion about the new life in Christ. The new self being lived out, especially in the context of the family. Because of this. Slavery was so interwoven into the fabric of first century Roman culture, the culture in which this church lived, that it was just a matter of what was. And so, so let's back up just a little bit further. The first reference to slavery in the Bible can be found all the way back in Genesis chapter 17, verse 23. And you can see it up here on the screen. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money. Notice the bold print, hopefully. Yeah, kind of see it up there. Every male in his household and circumcised them as God had told him to. Now, as we leave that up there for a moment, why would I highlight both born in the household and bought with his money? Because in that ancient culture, there were pretty much five different ways that one would become a slave. You can see the list up here on the screen. Number one is being born to the slaves of a household. And that's why we said born in Abraham's household. They were most probably referencing slaves, not sons. Because his son Ishmael is distinguished. Number two, being purchased from a trader. 
That is, what it say? All those in Abraham's household who had been bought with his money. Number three, you could sell oneself into slavery. Number four, the result of certain criminal offenses like breaking into someone's house and stealing, theft, that could get you slavery. And number five, being a prisoner of war. Slavery existed in most societies. Understand, most societies, as early as historical records account for, embraced slavery as a way of life. So by the time we get to the New Testament, Colossians, 25 to 30 years after Jesus was here, slavery was simply an integral part of the culture and the context of this writing. Now, you cannot picture first century slavery in the same narrative as that which existed 17th, 18th, and 19th century New World. They're not the same. For one, slaves in the first century often sold themselves into slavery for social or economic advancement. Now think about that for a minute. One would sell themselves into slavery for social or economic advancement. That's what generally is known as a bond servant. Many slaves were professionals, doctors, lawyers, business owners, and they were educated by their masters. It's also known that nearly one-third of the population of larger cities in the first century, like Rome, Ephesus, Antioch, and Corinth, were made up of those in a bond-servant-slave relationship. One-third. And there was no marked distinction between the servant and the master. You could not go along the streets of Rome, Ephesus, Antioch and look at someone's clothing or race or legal status and know whether or not they were a slave. And finally, the reason so many folks sold themselves into slavery was the liberal practice of manumission, which is the freeing of slaves, the releasing of that bond-servant relationship. In fact, in the first century, and don't misunderstand, this was for the benefit of the slave owner and the system. But manumission was practiced so liberally in the first century that when Caesar Augustus came into power, he issued laws restricting the number of slaves that could be manumitted in one year because it was overwhelming. Their culture. Most slaves were freed by the time they were 30 years old. So you can see why it might pay off to gain some social standing or some economic advancement by being educated or gaining a business if you're going to be free by the time you're 30 anyway. So to encounter an old lifelong slave in that day was very rare. And that's why Paul can seem so unconcerned about slavery and that institution when, as you see up here on the screen, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. Now that's not to say there was no dark side to it in the first century. There certainly was. And Paul does speak out to condemn one act, aspect of slavery in belonging to the vices that stand in contrast to the glory of God. 
You can see it up here. He records it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, where he's referencing ungodly, unholy actions as being among those who commit sexual immorality, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Now, if you see that footnote, uh, the footnote says... An enslaver is one who takes someone captive in order to sell them into slavery. That was condemned. So, to move to the text, with that background, with that understanding, Paul places the life of a slave and a master right in line with the familial setting of husband, wives, children, and fathers. Because slaves were pretty much seen as that way in first century. That's what some of those household conversions are about in the scriptures. So and so in his household came to Jesus. So Colossians chapter 3 verse 22. Slaves or bond servants or servants. Remember how we talked last week how the word love in the Greek has many different meanings? It's just love, love, love English, but there's phileo love in the Greek, which is brotherly love. There's eros love, which is sexual love. There's uh, agape love, which is a self-giving, unconditional love. But they just all mean love in English. Same way is true here. We don't exactly know how to handle this Greek term doulos. It can mean slave. Kind of born that way. It can mean bond servant, someone who sold themselves into. It can simply mean servant. For instance, if you jump down to chapter 4, verse 7 in Colossians, Paul's talking about Tychicus. And he says, chapter 4, verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow doulos in the Lord. Servant. Why not slave there? Well, because it doesn't fit the context. And that's the challenge of identifying and translating this word. You have to take the context in. So obviously when we're talking in our text, Matthew, or excuse me, Colossians chapter 3, we're talking about slaves and bond servants. Those who were born as such or those who sold themselves into. And what he says is, chapter 3, verse 22, Slaves, obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. That doesn't need much interpretation, does it? Pretty much does it itself. Obey in everything, those who are your masters. Now, obviously the limit to that is where it would contradict the will of God. We understand that. But he says, don't be one of those that only works while you're being watched. If you want some conviction today, let's translate that over to your job. <laughs> don't be one of those that only works when others are watching to gain their favor. In fact, he says in verse 23, Whatever you do, slaves, work at it heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance, not an, the inheritance as your reward for your serving the Lord Christ. That also doesn't need much interpretation. Basically, he's saying what? Do the right thing every time. Whether or not you're being watched, to gain the trust and the confidence of others, and you're going to receive this wonderful inheritance. You're not doing it for them anyway. You're doing it for Jesus. You're doing it for Jesus. And think about the promise of an inheritance for somebody who maybe doesn't own property or has never experienced freedom has never had an inheritance passed down. He says, hey, if you serve well, you're going to get this grand inheritance from God Almighty Himself. And then he says in verse 25, in contrast, for the wrongdoer, that person will be paid back for the wrong he has done and there is no partiality. That is, in contrast to living out the new life in Jesus Christ, regardless of your position in life, in contrast to that, 
If you're doing wrong, you're going to be punished. Doesn't matter who you are or what you're doing, you're going to be punished. That's what he's saying. The Apostle Peter addresses this. I want to put it up here on the screen a little more clearly when he says in chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you are receiving a beating for doing wrong and you endure it? That is, you're a wrongdoer. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. And that's his point. The point is to do right, living out the new life all the time, regardless of your circumstance. And then he moves on in chapter 4, verse 1, last verse for today, concerning masters. As he addressed husbands and wives and children and fathers, he's addressed slaves and now masters. And he says in chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Sounds like kind of a veiled threat, doesn't it? You're going to get your comeuppance if you don't watch yourself. Because you may be on the high spot now, but you can be brought low. You have a master in heaven. So what's the crux of all of this? It's the same emphasis that we have talked about our whole letter here in Colossians. It's about the new life in our relationship with Jesus Christ that surpasses and supersedes anything regarding the old person, the old way of life, or our old circumstance. That is, we're putting away the things of the earth and we're gaining a new citizenship a new freedom, a new inheritance, a new life. The new self in Christ, hang with me, I'm just about done. The new self in Christ goes beyond any social, legal, or religious construct. Our life should be demonstrated as the life of Christ flowing out of us irregardless of our circumstance or situation. That's the whole message. And Paul, in his letters to two young ministers, makes that so much more clear. And I want to show you up here. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writing to the young minister, in telling him to teach that all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect. I want to hear why, Paul. So that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. That's the purpose behind it. That's what we're talking about with this new life. So that God's name and the teaching about Him may not be slandered. And then he goes on to say to Titus, similarly... In chapter 2, 9 through 10, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back, not to steal, but to show they can be fully trusted. Why, Paul? So that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. That's the most important thing, church. That is, at any point in your new life, in any situation, in every conversation, in every action, the new life should shine through no matter who you are or what you're doing. In all things to the glory of God. Amen. You know, I just read, and I'll conclude with this, I read this book just recently, not as a part, not as a part of this message, before... And it's Uncle Tom's Cabin, in case you can't see it. I read it about two or three months ago. And you know in our culture that this term, Uncle Tom, is used in a derogatory fashion to insult someone. 
And I, I didn't really know because I'd never read the book before. So as I was reading the book and I saw what Harriet Beecher Stowe was casting this protagonist, Tom-like, I thought, man, if someone calls someone an Uncle Tom, that person ought to receive it as a compliment. Because here was a man that truly lived out the life of Christ in his enslaved position. With exemplary character. Uncle Tom was blessed to live a good portion of his life the caring family that elevated him to a position of importance and prominence within the estate. And he cared for the master's son, young George, and Tom taught him and everyone in the household of Mr. Shelby and later Mr. St. Clair what true Christianity looked like. This is a picture of true Christianity. However, Tom eventually found himself at the end of a cruel, ruthless master by the name of Simon Legree. And Legree's evil bent did not appreciate the light that Tom shone. And so, I beg your indulgence. Get up, you beast, said Legree, kicking Tom again. This was a difficult matter for one so bruised and faint. And as Tom made efforts to do so, Legree laughed brutally. What makes ye so spry this morning, Tom? Cotched a cold maybe last night? Tom by this time had gained his feet and was confronting his master with a steady, unmoved front. The devil you can, said Legree. Looking him over, I believe you haven't had got enough yet. Now, Tom, get right down on your knees and beg my pardon for your shines last night. That is Tom's refusal to beat other slaves. Tom did not move. Down, you dog, said Legree, striking him with his riding whip. Master Legree said, Tom, I can't do it. I did only what I thought was right. I shall just do so again if the time ever comes. I never will do a cruel thing, come what may. Yes, but ye don't know what may come, Master Tom. You think what you've done is something. I'll tell you, taint nothing, nothing at all. How would you like to be tied to a tree and have a slow fire lit around ye? Wouldn't that be pleasant, eh, Tom? Master, said Tom, I know you can do dreadful things to me. But while he stretched his hands upward and clasped them, he said, But after you've killed the body, there ain't no more you can do. And oh, there's all eternity to come after that. Eternity. The word thrilled through the black man's soul with a light and power as he spoke. It thrilled through the sinner's soul too, like a bite from the scorpion. Legree gnashed at him with his teeth, but the rage kept him silent. And Tom, like a man disenthralled, spoke in a clear and cheerful voice. Master Legree, as ye have bought me, I'll be a true and faithful servant to ye. I'll give ye all the work of my hands, all my time, all my strength, but my soul I won't give up to mortal man. I will hold on to the Lord and put His commands before all. Die or live, you may be sure on it. Master Legree, I ain't a grain of fear to die. I'd as soon die as not. Ye may whip me, starve me, burn me. It'll only send me sooner to where I want to go. I'll make you give out, though, for I'm done, said Legree in a rage. I shall have help, said Tom. You'll never do it. Who the devil's going to help you, said Legree scornfully. The Lord Almighty, said Tom. Damn you, said Legree, as with one blow of his fist, he felled Tom to the earth. Legree drew in a long breath. And suppressing his rage, he took Tom by the arm, approaching him face to face, said in a terrible voice, Hark ye, Tom, you think because I've let you off before, I don't mean what I say, but this time I've made up my mind and counted the cost. You've stood against me again and again. Now I'll conquer you or kill you. 
one or the other. I'll count every drop of blood that is in you and take them one by one till you give up. Tom looked up to his master and answered, Master, if you was sick or in trouble or dying and I could save you, I'd give you my heart's blood. And if taking every drop of blood in this poor old body would save your precious soul, I'd give them freely as the Lord gave him for me. Oh, Master, don't bring this great sin on your soul. It'll hurt you more than twill me. Do the worst you can. My troubles soon be over. But if you don't repent, yours won't never end. And at the tick of the clock could be heard with measuring silence the last moments of mercy to a hardened heart. In but a moment, with one hesitating pause, one irresolute, relenting thrill, and the spirit of evil came back with sevenfold vehemence, and the grief, foaming with rage, smote his victim to the ground. Yet Tom was not quite gone. His wondrous words and pious prayers had struck upon the hearts of the embruted blacks who had been the instruments of cruelty upon Tom. And the instant Legree withdrew, they took him down and sought to call him back to life. Sartin, we's been doing a dreadful wicked thing, said Sambo. Hope's master will have to count for it, not we. They washed Tom's wounds and said, O oh, Tom, we's been awful wicked to ye. I forgive you with all my heart, said Tom faintly. O oh, Tom, do tell us who is Jesus anyhow, said Sambo. Jesus, the one that's been standing by you so all this night, who is He? And the word roused the failing, fainting spirit and he poured forth a few energetic sentences of the wondrous one, his life, his death, his everlasting presence and power to save. And they wept, both the two savage men. Why didn't we ever hear this before, said Sambo. But I do believe, I can't help it, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Poor critters, said Tom. I'd be willing to bar all I have if it had only bring you to Christ. O oh Lord, give me these two more souls, I pray. And that prayer was answered. You see, to all but Legree, Tom's hard work, trustworthiness, and genuine Christian character while suffering for doing good and not slandering the name or the teaching of God by his actions, he made it attractive and desirable. So that Quimbo and Sambo came to the Lord Jesus. For us, we are not in slavery, thank God, but to the Lord. And there is no room for racism in the new life. But in your work, in your speech, in your life, are you working for the reward later to come? In eternity? Or contributing to the casualty of Christianity in our culture by living contrary to the new life? It all comes down to living what we believe. That the very word eternity enthralls our hearts and lifts our souls and we in this new life seek the things above and so in this life affect the lives of others we encounter down below. For church, we are always serving some master. So today, whose is yours? Let's pray.